Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day you've given us, Lord. Uh, we just ask you to uh, clear our minds of the distractions of this world, the cares of this world, and the things that we view sometimes as being important that, uh, Lord, you've told us before or not. Father, I pray that we just can uh, turn our heads and turn our eyes towards you. Father, I pray that we're drawn closer to you by the words that you've pre prepared for us. Lord, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, folks. <clears throat> we are few, but we are mighty today. A Co couple of things I wanted to kind of throw out at you today uh, to keep in your prayers is, of course, our, our little church here, uh, the mountain. <clears throat> also... Um, as we prepare, too, for Celebrate Recoveries coming here in, in January, uh, we need a couple of things to get that going. Uh, one thing is a lot of money, which has been donated to uh, uh, Celebrate Recovery here at the mountain through uh, Bluegrass Ironman. So the big financial burden is lifted. And that's not a little bit of money. That's thousands of dollars they've given for this church to be able to uh, minister to people in this community. So that's a big piece of it. The second piece of it is the church for us to get involved in it and for us to be uh, salt and light here in this room. And there's going to be people coming into this building who have never been here before. Maybe people have never been to a church before. <clears throat> but they're going to come in here looking for... Uh, away, away from the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that maybe have affected them. Now, one of the things that we want to clear up about Celebrate Recovery is that uh, there's a perception that, well, I must be an alcoholic to be there, or I must be a drug addict to be there, and that's not the case at all. Celebrate Recovery is to help individuals get past the hurts, habits, hang-ups that they uh, experience in life, yes, but also to draw them closer to church. Mike likes to call Celebrate Recovery the purest form of a church that there is. And I, I agree with you there. It is worship, it is food, it is fellowship, and it's growth all in this one building. <clears throat> so we're going to try to pull this off starting, I believe it's January the 6th will be our first time. But what we need is we need uh, some of us to get involved in that. It'll be a Wednesday evening to participate in it, to get into a 12-step program. Um, and, and you may just got through life without ever having struggled with anything. If you have, come see me because I just want to be near you. <laughs> but uh, the rest of us have struggled with some stuff, and you need to go through one of these 12-step programs. Mike, have I caught everything, or is there more? Okay, I did good. <clears throat> That's going to be it. <clears throat> You're going to hear more about that every week until January the 6th. <clears throat> but this is a this is a way to impact this community, impact this community uh, for the purposes of the kingdom of God. So if it's something that you're thinking, well, I don't think this format is really for me, it, is it? I think you need to ask yourself that question about maybe, maybe this is something you need to, to be involved in. I want to tell you about that. Uh, Mike is back on both feet, um, sort of. <clears throat> he is working through his recovery, uh, physical recovery. So got a doctor now that uh, is hoping that he'll get him closer. Jennifer is back up. She is in therapy. She's doing uh, better. Ken is doing better. Church is getting healthier. Hallelujah. We're glad for that. And also want to let you know that next Wednesday at uh, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, I've been asked to speak there uh, at their f end of their fall retreat. So if any of you are looking for something to do on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. It's at 437 Ferguson. It's off of Versailles Road. You get all the way almost down to the arena <clears throat> where you go over the bridge there. You turn to the left on uh, Robertson. And then it turned left on Judy, I think, and then you'll see the church right there. Right, it's an old, 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 old inner city church that uh, I attended for a year and a half <coughs> before uh, we launched this church. It's a wonderful church, wonderful church family. So Wednesday evening, if you need a ride, call Pat or I, and we'll be glad to uh, load you up in the back of our or in the back seat of the truck and uh, haul you there. So there's some things that are going on this week. Well, I hope you've had a good week. Hope it's been a good week. Weather's changing a little bit. It's turned a little bit fall. Makes me think that maybe uh, winter is in the offing. Uh, Pat and I have been talking about maybe thinking about getting heat turned on at home and getting the firewood in. 
Um, but as we look at this year, it's kind of looking toward the end of the year. It makes me think about the opposite. I'm kind of an opposite thinking person. So I asked the question, how many of you made New Year's resolutions this past year? Not one person. <laughs> okay, well, that's the end of this message. <laughs> well, I have a few uh, resolutions that people have come up with in the past. One of them says, I have resolved not to do drugs anymore because I get the same effect just by standing up really fast. Might be a resolution that you've made in the past. I have resolved uh, to live in my own little world because at least I'm known there. Great resolution. Another person says, I have resolved to stay married because it's so great to find that one special person that you can annoy for the rest of your life. Great reason to get married. And another resolution is, I have resolved not to make any resolution because nobody's perfect. I'm nobody, therefore I am perfect. Not the best ideas in the world. I'm not a big resolution guy. I'm kind of one of those people that says, if you're struggling with something, if you um, need to make improvements on your life, why wait until January the 1st to get involved in it? Start today. Today's a good day to start with that. I have nothing against resolutions. And for those who make them and stick with them, I, I'm kind of in awe of you and kind of respect you for that. But today what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you an idea of a resolution that you can start today or the first of the year and every year. It could be your resolution every year. This is going to be my New Year's resolution. I think it can be the best one that you've ever had. It's a resolution that you can use year after year after year after year for the rest of your life. And it comes right out of the Scriptures, out of the book of Mark in chapter 12. But before we get into that specific scripture, I want to give you a little uh, background to kind of set up Mark 12. Jesus had just been kind of uh, ambushed by a bunch of critics of his, and they were trying to get him to slip up on some of his scripture. They were trying to use the scripture against him. So they'd been trying to trap him into a corner verbally, and it didn't work. It had never worked before, and it's not going to work this time, but they're trying one more time to try to trick Jesus. One of them was kind of standing off to the back, and he was watching all this going on, and he was listening to it, and finally he stepped forward to Jesus and had his own question. And it's a question, I think, that goes to the very heart of what the Bible says our relationship is supposed to be like with God, how we're to relate to him. And as I said, this comes out of the book of Mark. And Ron, if you would put that up on the screen. Mark 12, 28 through 34 says these words. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right to say that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. From this scripture here, what I want you to see is what I think might be the best New Year's resolution, or at least at the top of your resolution list for the rest of your life, for anyone that calls themselves a Christian. And it's this, very simply. Your resolution, I believe, should be to take practical steps to know God better and love Him more. That would be a great resolution every year, just that simply, to take practical steps to know God better and love Him more. Now, you notice that I did not say, know God better and love Him more. I didn't say that. What I said is, I said, take practical steps to know God better and love him more. So I'm going to give you some ideas today to do that, to type move you into a closer relationship with him. And as we look at this passage just a little bit uh, deeper, especially verses 30 and 31, I want you to see that God wants you to love him in four different ways. There's four actual different ways that God wants you to love him. And we're going to look at them briefly, and so you can see how you can put those into a resolution starting today 
Or you can hold off until January the 1st. Here's the first one. God wants us to love Him with everything that's inside of us. That's what that scripture said. God wants us to love Him with everything that's inside of us. The scripture worded it this way. It said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. What this means is that you are to love God passionately. We're to have a passion about Him. Um, sometimes when I talk about people and I'm uh, at work talking about uh, people, the clients of ours, I'll ask the question, what made mom's heart beat fast? In other words, what was she passionate about? What in her life made, uh, made her feel good? Or was she passionate about? And when I'm talking about passion, I'm not talking about some romantic novel, sappy type of thing. I'm not talking about some romantic comedy movie or anything like that. I'm talking about the passion that drives each and every one of us. A lot of us right now, I know we're thinking of our grandchildren. Or children. Those are things that make us passionate about. Some of us, we collect cars or we have a certain car or something. We're passionate about that. We're passionate about our house. But things that we're passionate about are the things that define us. <clears throat> if a person is passionate about farming, farming drives their life. If you're passionate about being an accountant or, or a nurse or a doctor, those are the things that drive your, you every day in your day-to-day -day life, being involved with that. That's what you make your decisions on, is things that make you feel passionate about. Well, with God, we're supposed to love Him so much that we are drive driven to make Him pleased with our life. He is how we should define how we live our lives in a way that brings uh, happiness to Him. We live according to a way that honors God in everything that we do. It means that living by God's agenda, that's what we need to do, is live by God's agenda, live in such a way and behave in such a way that he sits back and just kind of to grins and thinks, I'm, I'm proud of the way they act. We're to do our jobs, we're to raise our family, all the things that we're supposed to do and that we do do in life in ways that reflect biblical principles and biblical priorities in our life, not principles and priorities that society puts out. Because we can tell by watching the news, that's not a good set of priorities or principles. We're to say to God every day, you've got me. I'm in. 100% in. I've jumped in. I've crossed that line. I'm 100% committed to loving you the way that you want to be loved. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. About how to love God passionately. That it's a passion in your life from the moment you get up in the morning until the moment you go to bed at night. And here's a couple of ideas about how you can do this. One of them is to adopt or renew a program about reading the Bible. <clears throat> and I, I, I know every person in this room has a Bible. And I don't know if every person every month opens that Bible and reads something out of it. I don't know if they do it every week or every day or throughout the day. <clears throat> but you should have a program that is comfortable to you to read the Bible to get into the Bible. Maybe you've got one, you've kind of stepped away from it, you need to get back to it and re uh, commit yourself to reading or memorizing Scripture. There's someone who attends this church that uh, for years while she was in high school, she would laminate Scripture. And the reason she would laminate the Scripture is so that she could take it in the shower. And she had a little hook, a suction cup hook in the shower, and she would hook her Scripture up there while she was in the shower every morning taking her shower she would memorize scripture on these laminated sheets of paper. That was her system, and it worked very well for her for years. So my question is, what's your system? Do you, every Sunday after church, go home and spend an hour reading the Bible? Do you every Monday? Is that Monday morning, or do you get up every day, Monday through Friday, and you spend 30 minutes in the scripture, the word, every day? Do you have a program? I'm not going to tell you what your program should be. There's a lot of them out there. Read the Bible in 365 days. You know, you read a psalm, you read a Proverbs, and you read one scripture, one chapter out of the, the Gospels. There's a lot of programs out there. I'm not telling you what to do, but do you have a program? Or is that something you've gotten out of the habit of doing? Another idea is to adopt or renew one of the spiritual disciplines, like fasting or extended prayer or solitude. Those are disciplines that are given to us that we're to do, and there's a purpose for them. And that's the first thing we really need to do, is we need to figure out what are those reasons? Why are we supposed to fast? What does that do for me? How does that benefit me? 
when you fast or when you go into periods of extended prayer or solitude and you focus on the Lord, what that does is that helps you to open your spirit up to Him. And what happens in a lot of cases is with each and every one of us is if we go through this busy world that we live in, we are bombarded with televisions and horns and traffic and jobs and internet and all these different things. And if you set aside time where you can focus on the Lord, you will open up a spiritual pathway to Him where He can better communicate with you through the Scriptures, through the body of believers, or maybe even uh, through some other miraculous way. I'll give you a great example of this. How many of you have been out to the Bischoff's and tried to get a cell phone connection? <laughs> it's impossible. They live about 35 miles west of nowhere. And there is no cell phone protection or uh, program out there. But there's, there is. But there's a lot of hills in that area, and you get down in one of those valleys, and you can't get any connection at all. If you do get any kind of connection, you're going to get a lot of static, and you're going to get a lot of, uh, I can't hear you, you're not coming through, and you kind of try to stand with one leg up and one arm over here, and maybe you can become a human antenna. But it's hard to get any kind of a, a clear communication with a cell phone from where they live. <clears throat> now, when you get in that same cell phone, you get into town, you get into flat ground, all of a sudden your cell phone picks up really well. You can hear very clearly. Well, that's what happens with God. You'll be in a position where you just don't get good reception because of your environment, your location, what's going on around you. You need to put yourself in a position where you get good reception with Him. And then what you'll do is you'll see that God will begin to communicate with you more clearly. You'll be able to hear Him more clearly, and it will transform your life. Then you can begin to love Him the way Jesus says you're supposed to love Him. And then number two, Jesus wants you to love Him with all of our brains. And I don't know if you've ever heard about that before from a spiritual standpoint, but the Scripture says very clearly, and with all your mind. You're supposed to use your mind in communicating with God. One of the things that drives me in ministry is the idea that we don't have a lot of Christians who actively think about using their heads with their relationship with God. They think about the heart or the soul or the spirit, but not their minds. And if you think about this, the Christian faith becomes full of all kinds of cliches uh, where you you know, people will say, uh, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. You know, they come up with, there's nothing wrong with that, but they're cliches. What would Jesus do? And Christians come up with these things and we repeat them to each other, even in the secular world, and we become very good about that. But living for Jesus is not about quoting a bunch of scriptures or a bunch of cliches. The Christian faith is a very reasonable Christian faith faith. It's a very reasonable thing to grasp. If uh, Christians would allow um, others on the outside to just hear about our faith, it's a very believable uh, faith. And I believe that even among the unbelievers, if they get a chance to intelligently listen to our story about Jesus, I think it's very believable. And I think it'll stand up to a test by non-believers if they are intellectually honest, and that's the question, if they examine all the evidence, I think that most people will realize that it's reasonable and it's logical to follow the Christian faith. Another need we have is for people who can accurately apply what the Bible says in real life situations. And I think that is a problem that we have in Christendom too. People from the outside look in at us and they say, their life is a disaster. Their life is a wreck. They're not uh, able to handle their finances, their marriage, their whatever the th the they're going through. So how is Christianity really helping them? So what we need to do is we need to make sure that people see us studying scriptures and applying it to our own individual lives. Even in the church. A lot of churches follow a motto that uh, they're all about real faith with a real God for real people in the real world. But are we really taking the lessons that uh, the Scriptures talk about and applying it to my individual life? 
Is it really taking a hold of us in every area of our lives? Not just in our spiritual life, but in our finances, our romances, and all the other answers. Well, here's a couple of ideas that you can use to improve. <clears throat> One is to attend and participate in a Bible study. Church is great, but you're going to get 30 minutes here. And 30 minutes, I don't think, is enough. I love the old program that we used to have at Southland years ago that they said, commit three hours a week, just three hours a week, to your faith. One is in church, one is serving somewhere, and one is studying somewhere for one hour. So you go to church for an hour, you serve somewhere one hour a week, and you study one hour a week. So I suggest that we all get involved in an adult Bible study. And we're, we're working through trying to get one established here for women. Um, but men, uh, we meet at uh, Iron Man, or uh, men, we meet at Panera on Tuesday evenings at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going through the book of Job right now. We're coming out of the desert, and we're getting into chapter 30, 35, where it gets kind of exciting. It's pretty, pretty dull there for a while, so we're coming through that. But get involved and actively participate. Don't go to a Bible study and think, well, I don't know nothing, so I'm just going to sit here and be a bump on a log. Ask questions. Get actively involved. And read something that challenges you. I'm always amazed. Pat always has a book on the coffee table at home. She's reading something. She's got her Bible. She's got her devotion book but she's got some kind of a book that she's reading. Ken Kreutz reads constantly. He's always reading something that's fascinating, usually 99% of the time, something that's driving his faith. So read something in addition that's challenging. I will tell you this, and I will confess this. I did not read my first book until I was 35. That's the truth. I never read a book until I was 35. I was just a little bit too sharp. I could get a book to read for a book report. I could read the first chapter and the last chapter, make up the center. I was always on target. I always did well in book reports, but I never read a book until I was 35. Anybody want to guess what the book was? No, it wasn't the Bible. <laughs> it was uh, Helter Skeller by uh, Vincent Bugliosi about uh, Yeah, that was the first book I ever read in my life. Fascinated. I thought, wow, these books are kind of cool. And uh, so I've become a reader after that. Read something that challenges you. If you don't know what to read, see Ken, see Pat, and ask him, hey, what are you reading now? What, what are some bo books that have changed your life? And have them kind of guide you on that. And be careful too, because there is many people, as many people as there are out there that are trying to write something that's good that will change your life, there's that many more nutcases out there that are writing garbage that are trying to destroy your life. So be very prayerful before you read anything or uh, ask someone. I worked at Southland with a guy that was a voracious reader. And before I read anything, I would always go to Will Briggs and say, have you read this? What's it about? Is it a good book? Is it a bad book? Is it a dangerous book? Read something that challenges you. And make a commitment <clears throat> to use this filter that the Bible gives you. The Bible is a filter for you to run everything through. So if you're out and you're reading a book that's not good, if you've got a good Bible background, you're going to know instantly whether that's a value to you or a danger to you based on what the Scriptures do. So make a commitment to use the filter of the Scriptures to evaluate what you read and what you see and what you hear. The Scriptures say separate the chaff from the wheat. And that's what reading is too, is separate the good stuff from the bad stuff. There are a lot of stuff that the Bible says is fine. This is good for you. This, is, this information is good for you. And there's a lot of stuff the Bible will say, stay away from this. Stay away from these people. Stay away from these things. And you need to know the difference between those. The Bible is a great filter for keeping us from the stuff that can get us into trouble. So make it a point to know God with your brains. There's a third way that Jesus tells us to love God. He says uh, God wants us to love him with our gifts and our abilities. <clears throat> the way it's uh, worded in the scripture, it says with all of our strength. He wants us to use our talents, our spiritual gifts, our finances, our influence, whatever he's given us to influence the world for his kingdom. It's called loving him practically. Loving him practically. He doesn't gift us with things to do for just ourselves. He wants us um, to use those for his glory, the gifts that he's given us. 
And here's a couple of ideas about how uh, you can use those ideas. First of all, take an inventory of what your gifts and your talents are and maybe look at how you can use them here at the mountain. Do you know that in the last couple of years, there's been twice that uh, once I paid someone to clean up our parking lot over on the side of the building so that you park in a reasonably nice area. There's no reason to do that. There's people here that can do projects like that around here, the handyman type things, get involved with the church, manual labor, it's all good. Musically, organizationally, all those type of things can be a benefit inside the church. Believe me, whatever you have, the church can use. Because God has gifted you in a particular way to bless the church. It's a double way of going around. So we'll think about that. Another way is to take an inventory of your spiritual gifts and think about how you can help the church outside of this church. Spiritual gifts like uh, faith, administration, leadership, evangelism, service, hospitality are all things that you can use not only in the church but outside of the church. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has given you at least one spiritual gift. Most people have many spiritual gifts, some that are like a primary spiritual gift, a secondary, a fourth fifth. I think most tests that you take will show that you're gifted in seven different areas, the average person. One will be a primary giftedness, and it might be hospitality or mercy or encouragement. Where uh, Have you ever run into one of those people that walks up to you? You're one of them, Teresa. You're one of the person that has the gift of encouragement. You're just always encouraging me, I know personally. That's a spiritual gift. God's given that to her. He hadn't given it to me. I mean, I'll think, gosh, Ron, you do a great job. I'll tell him about it later. I don't have that gift. We have the gift of hospitality. God has gifted each believer with a spiritual gift. It may be just how to, to move their hands and their eyes and their minds to fix things. It may be to sing. It may be to play an instrument. There's a million different ways. Uh, Thomas with his technical expertise here in the church. It's a gift from God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has gifted you. Accept it and use it. If you don't use it, the day will come when he will ask you, why did you never do what I gave you to do? Why did you not do that? And you'll be accountable for that. It's fascinating to look back on a previous year or a previous season and see where God has been. And it's easy to do that and look back and say, well, God is, man, I can see where God gifted me to do this or gifted me to do that or help in this area or that area. But what would happen in the, for the kingdom of God if we were proactive about that? God gave us gifts and abilities to use. And using them for him is loving him. That's exactly what that is. We are to love God with everything that's inside of us. We are to love God with our brains. We are to love Him with our gifts. We are to love Him with our abilities. <clears throat> and there's one more area that we're supposed to love God. God wants us to love Him by loving others. The Scripture says it this way. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is loving others socially. That's what it means. I've said this over and over and over and over again about our faith. Our faith is to pour out above us and beyond us to the people around us. We're supposed to do good things for the people near us. We're supposed to help people around us. We're supposed to serve people around us. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not that real outgoing social butterfly type person, and I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the way that you can touch God in a small way, each and every person here. And there are a lot of ways to do that. One of the ways that I can think of just off the top of my head is share your weekend with the people on Monday morning. What do people ask you every Monday morning? How's your weekend? You know what the first thing I say every week? I talk about my church. First thing I mention, well, church, we had a good lesson, or last week I said not so good. Or I'll say we had Dwayne Brewer was here, somebody spoke, somebody's coming in next week, there's going to be a guest speaker for us. I'll say something about the worship, I'll say something about you guys. I'll say, man, my church family was there, and we just hung around after the lesson was over and spent about an hour just eating donuts and talking, and, and just what a great group of people. <clears throat> By sharing those stories, I someday believe that somebody is going to step up and go, I don't have that in my life. I need that on Sunday for my life. I need to be a part of that. Can I come? 
I'm going to say, sure. That's sharing that little gift. That's an area where I can change a person's life just by telling a story. How was your weekend? Had a great weekend. The little church that I belong to is just a nice group of people, and I just love being there with them. Sunday's always a special day for Pat and I, and people look at me. That's how I came to the Lord, back to the Lord, is jealousy. I saw people that were happy, people that were at peace with themselves, and I went, I don't have any of that. I'm going to get what they got. So I'm going to start hanging out with them so I can learn. Volunteer some area in your life. Salvation Army, Habitat for Humanity, <clears throat> um, some kind of charitable organization. Right over here, next block over, we have a men's house and a women's house um, that you can go in and, and just ask, hey, you guys need help over here? Is there anything I can do? Can I prepare a meal for you? I've made a pie. I've made a cake I'd like to help you guys out with. Get involved in something. Look for ways to help people in your neighborhood, in your very neighborhood. You know, we're, we're getting ready to head toward winter. So if you've got a strong back, you know, maybe help a, a widow person or a single uh, mom do her uh, shovel or sidewalk or maybe help keep somebody's gutters uh, cleaned out. Maybe if you're just a cook or a griller, you can be that person that sets up the grill in their backyard and invites everybody on the block over to my house Saturday afternoon, 2 o'clock, we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs. If for no obvious agenda other than I just want to get to know you better and provide a meal for you, a lot of us can do for that. that. And to also pray for God to share an opportunity with you. Pray to God that God will give you an opportunity to share Jesus with your neighbor. And you don't have to say, listen, let me walk you through the book of salvation. Let me take you through Romans chapter 11 and 12 and give you... It's not about that. It's about sharing what God has done in your life. You know, if Sunday mornings are important to you, why wouldn't they be important to everyone? Why aren't they important to your neighborhood? Maybe nobody's just ever explained it to them and just said what a community is like or an opportunity to, to grow a little bit and become a little bit better. Look for those opportunities and pray for those opportunities. Lord, give me an opportunity to share my faith with someone this week. Pray that prayer. Your neighbors need Jesus just like you need Jesus. So look for those opportunities to share that life-changing message with Jesus. And again, it's easy to look back on our life through a previous year and see all the things that we've done or been involved in, but I just think we could do it a little bit better. Today is a new day. Today is a new day. It's a new beginning. Every day is the first day of the rest of our lives. So how are you going to handle this? How are you going to begin again? A lot of people will come up with a list, and they'll come up with, here's 37 things I want to change on. You're, fit, you're going to fail. I'll tell you before you ever start. If you're coming up with a list of 20, 30, 40 things that you're going to work on in your life, you're setting yourself up for a disaster. I say one, maybe two things. Two areas of your life, maybe three. Push it to three, but no further than that. If there's three areas in your life that the Holy Spirit is saying, you better get this under control in your life, don't make it a list of 40 things because you're going to set yourself up for failure. One, Two, possibly, only, and run with those. Trust God to do a work in you and trust God to do a work through you and you'll see what will happen. If you go back to the story that we talked about in uh, verse 34, where Jesus says to this religious leader, he says, uh, do you, are, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You know, that he wasn't talking to a plumber or a carpenter or a guy that was just on the street there, the average farmer, who he was talking to was one of the religious leaders of Israel. That's who he was talking to. Jesus told him, a teacher of the law, you're close. You're not there, but you're close. He was one of the big guns in the religious community. Now, why would Jesus need to say something like that, you're close, to somebody like him? who was so well-educated and so well-informed. It's because he had an erroneous perception of what God was all about. Even with all of his learning, even with all of his education, even with all of his training, he was blind to the truth. It happens in the church all the time. It happens in the church all the time. Being religious doesn't uh, cut it according to Jesus. So what does it take to be a part 
of the kingdom of God. It all boils down to this, and that's taking Jesus at His word. I believe that Jesus will tell me one thing and expect me to do one thing with it, where He may tell Jesus you the same thing, but expect something else out of it. Jesus will speak to each one of us just a little bit differently through the same word. He said that unless we are born again, we can never get into the kingdom of heaven. We can't do that. In other words, unless a person understands and believes that Jesus died for our sins, he went into the grave for three days, and then he came out. And unless we put our full faith and our trust in that simple truth, that God came back from death to one day have a home for us, if we don't get that, I don't think we'll ever get in. It doesn't make any difference how nice we are. It doesn't make any difference what kind of language we use. It doesn't make any difference what kind of good deeds we do. If you're this or you're that, it doesn't make any difference. The only thing that will get you into heaven is trusting Jesus. The Bible says that if you've broken even one of God's commands, you might as well have broken them all because you broke one. And if you break one of them, then the punishment for that is eternity in hell except through Jesus Christ. Now those aren't my words. That's not Brad just being mean or harsh. Or, that's Jesus' words. It's just the truth. But the good news is, is that Jesus also said that he came so that we could escape the punishment that we deserve because of the way we live our lives, by putting our trust in him. So the question becomes, was Jesus telling us the truth? You know, was he telling us the truth? Because if he wasn't, maybe, maybe he was a liar. Maybe Jesus was insane. Maybe he didn't know the truth or what the truth was. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and the only way to heaven. And there was absolutely no one on earth to get us to heaven except him outside of our faith in him. A good teacher would never say such a thing as he said. They would never make the claims that he made if they weren't true. And if he's nuts, then he isn't the Son of God. So, if he was a liar or insane, then we couldn't entrust anything that he had to say, even the things that we'd like to hear. Because not Jesus, a lot of times people think, well, there's a lot of rules, a lot of pressure on us to keep uh, us bound or controlled. Well, there's a lot of things that Jesus says that are kind of neat. Even the things we'd like, we wouldn't be able to believe. The Bible is very clear that everyone who chooses to call on Jesus finds forgiveness for their sins and a home in heaven every person that does it. You can walk out of here today knowing for sure that that's a promise. That's a promise from him. You don't have to think about it anymore. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to wonder if that's the truth. It is the truth. If you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, he died on a cross, he laid in a grave for three days, he came out of that fully human, not a ghost, not a spirit, not an aberration. He was a person. He had holes in his hands where the nails went through. He was completely human, just like me. He stood there with his friends, knowing them, recognizing them. What's for dinner? I'm hungry. He was fully human. You can't earn your way into heaven. There's no amount of good deeds that you can do to get there. There's no amount of charity that you can give to get into there. There's no amount of religion that you can have that will get you there. Baptism won't get you into heaven. Taking communion doesn't get you into heaven. Being a good church goer doesn't get you into heaven. Being a preacher in a church doesn't get you into heaven. Remember that teacher of the law. His religion and his status in the community, which was at the very top of it, wasn't good enough to get him in. All that we can do as individuals is say to Jesus, I am a sinner and I know it. I need your forgiveness. I believe in my heart that you died for me. I believe that you rose from the grave and I believe that one day I will live in heaven with you. As much as you can do that, if you believe that, I believe it's done. Don't take my word for it. Take Jesus' word for it. It's all written in the Scriptures that I've asked you to verify. He is not a liar. And He is not insane. He is the Son of God who loves this world so much that He went through what He went through for you. Don't let it go to waste. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to move into a time of communion. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for, um, for loving us the way you did, loving us so much that you sent your Son to us.
loving us so much that you have so much patience with us. So much patience with us, Lord. Thank you for that. Father, you have given us opportunity and opportunity and opportunity to grow closer to you. And sometimes we do, Father. I think every day I, I move a little bit closer, but maybe not every day. So, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit infuses in us the need for us to change in some way, Father, to grow closer to you. Maybe that's just to, to gain more knowledge, to gain more information. Maybe that's just to serve the community. Maybe that's to make somebody's life just a little bit better. Maybe that's a, a, in some way that I need to change in my own life with a critical spirit that I have or with language that maybe isn't, doesn't honor you or glorify you. Maybe it's something inside of me that keeps me from stepping up and telling a story on a Monday morning about how my weekend was and inviting someone to come with me to church on Sunday. Maybe it's some little step like that. Maybe my purpose in life, Father, is one purpose, and that's to speak to the person that lives next door to me and tell them, I think you would enjoy coming to church with me on Sunday. Can I pick you up? Can I bring you with me? Maybe that's the whole purpose that you were here for, is to change that one person's life. Father, for those times that you call on our name, that you put us into service, that you gift us and you call us to go to work for you somewhere in our community or with our ch church, that we uh, just don't hear your name, Father, I ask for your forgiveness, knowing that I'll receive it. Father, I ask for another chance, too. So speak to us clearly, Lord. Father, as we move into this time of communion, <clears throat> the sacrament of communion, Father, may the, the spirit and the reason for communion pierce our hearts. Pierce our hearts this morning, Father. May we be transformed by the memory of why we do this. That Jesus, Lord, you came to our earth not because you had to, but because you wanted to. Not because you were ordered to, because you loved us so much you needed to do this. Father, he, Jesus, you came to us and asked that any time that we meet, that we would do this in memory of you, that we would take this bread and that we would uh, it would be used as a symbol of your broken body. And that, Father, we would take this juice as a memory of the blood that you shed for us, the blood that was uh, drained into the ground. Father, I pray that in this next little bit that we get to spend some serious time with you, Father. And that uh, we're drawn closer to you, yes, but we're transformed in this house today. Lord, I ask you to be with us as we go out into the world this week. Make us bold in our faith, Father. Transform us, Father, into the person you would have us be. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ever feel left out? Ever feel like you just don't understand? Or that nobody understands you? You ever feel like nobody cares? Come climb the mountain. It's nothing like you've ever seen. Our philosophy is simple. Love God, love people. The Mountain Community and Christian Learning Center. It's faith, it's family, and it's friends. Stroll in, grab a donut, some coffee, and grab a seat. Enjoy the company of a warm, welcoming family of Christ followers as we encourage, support, and worship together. No Sunday's best here. Simply come as you are. Come as your own Father would have you. On Sundays, 9 a.m. is Happy Hour Fellowship with a message from Pastor Brad Allred or a guest speaker starting at 10. If you're looking for a church family or simply looking for a change, stop by and visit. We'd love to have you.